So 10 years ago, I worked in Google, and exactly 10 years ago, and my manager discovered something on my computer, and she asked, like, what is this? What kind of project is it? And I said, it's a category theory and calculations in it. Category theory? What's the reaction? So the world has changed since, so like everybody knows category theory. And we've been having Bay Area categories and types for, for about 12 years now, a meetup. So you can look it up and join. So like half of today's talks, or maybe like the bigger half of today's talks, were connected with categories. So I'm not going to explain what a category is. You know categories. You know the category of sets, like all sets, although it's not exactly specified like what kind of sets we are talking about and what axiomatics and so on. You know categories like Haskell. Well, there's much more than one Haskell category. Haskell with exactly pure functions, that's it. Or Haskell where functions are partial, like head is not a function, a pure function. Head is a partial function. Or Haskell with Clisely, where we do something about like things that don't happen. Like uh, it's similar to partial function. In Scala, we have at least like kind of Scala category where two functions can be composed or two methods. Also, we have another category in Scala with inheritance, where like one type is in, uh, subtype is a subtype from another. So from that, you you can also build categories. And when you talk about <coughs> Covariant functors, that's about this second categ uh, category, Scala with inheritance. Any type class is a category. Well, that's arguable, but that's just my personal view. And there are more categories, like Greg Files today, uh, he's talked about duality and how to delete, ha delete half, well, more than half, actually, because like, he showed how to delete not only op, but also partials, classly, and whatever. So he showed a lot of categories to us. And there are a little bit more categories around. So here are some that I like, started building in, I built it in Java, I built them in Scala. So the first category is called zero. And do you see that category? It's invisible because it has zero objects and zero arrows. In, in the Scala code that is available on GitHub, it's denoted as underscore zero. That, uh, so it's a category where objects are ints, Arrows are pairs, in the, in, and it's ju just a segment. Zero means like there are no elements there. Category one consists of one uh, object, and I don't draw <coughs> identity arrows. So it consists of just one object, and that's it. Well, this one plus means one plus one. So it's rendering issue. It just, oh my god, no. OK. So I'll explain uh, the problems with rendering. <laughs> so this is the category one plus one, just two objects and no arrows between them. It's like this, and the objects are named A and B. Uh, the rest is built, uh, those identities. Category two is displayed here, this. It has two objects, zero and one, and an arrow from zero to one, and also two identities, that's it. So that's how it's defined here, because it's a segment, it's just a partial order. Category three is another segment, uh, three elements, zero, one, two, and it consists of this. So segment can uh, build like any partial, uh, linear partial order numbers from zero to whatever. So <coughs> the class for category, for this kind of categories, not big ones like uh, we have like in your compiler that understands uh, composition and so on, but this class of tiny categories looks like this. It's a class category, types of object, type of object, type of arrows, and it has a graph inside, and it also extends a graph. A graph inside serves for providing, storing objects and storing arrows. So that's how it is. Uh, it's nodes, it's known as nodes in graph, but it's no, uh, known as objects in categories. Uh, we have unit, every object has a unit, and um, multiple, uh, composition um, from, uh, for two pairs of arrows. They can be composed, but not all of them. I have the method called equals, but category theory is not equational, so equality of two categories is like under question. I just had to have it for running unit tests. But what does it mean? It's a graph, so what is a graph? 
A graph is defined like this. So we have nodes, we have arrows. D0, D1 means domain and codomain of an arrow. And basically, it extends a set of nodes, but with like some things. So one of the things is home, meaning a set, well, like, it's kind of questionable. Why is it a set? But that's a different story. So set in Scala sense, not in set theory sense. So home, uh, all arrows from uh, one object to another, and how it is built. Like, it's set of all arrows where we filter them such that domain is from and codomain is to. So that's it. It's a regular tri uh, trivial set of uh, set, quote unquote, of arrows from one object to another. So more of those tiny categories. Category four uh, consists of just, it's a linear order, consists of four objects. Parallel pair, two objects zero and one, and two arrows, A and B. We don't need any composition except with identity, but identity composition, when you build the category, is being uh, built. So here the constructor of this category, uh, like I pass a string and it's being parsed. So we have object zero, 01, arrows from zero, 01 and from zero, 01, and no composition provided. Well, because composition with identities is kind of guessed. Uh, a category that is called pullback for some, like, categorical reasons. So we have three objects, C, B, and D, and an arrow from C to D, and from uh, B to D, and it's defined like this. So we have object B, C, D, arrows B, D, arrows C, D, and again, like, we don't care about composition. A category called square. So here I also drawn this diagonal that is kind of assumed to exist. So four objects A, B, C, D, arrows A to C, C to D, a to B, uh, B to D, and their composition, and it's a commutative square, and their composition from A to D. If the square were not commutative, we would have two arrows here. So here we have the same collection of arrows, and we needed to define a composition. So AB followed by BD is AD, and AC followed by CD is AD. So the same AD. So that's it, and when, the, when this category class, when the parser uh, parses it, and the category is being built, so all the things are being validated, so that we won't have like a, a bad category that is not a category, like associativity is being checked and all these rules. So these are small categories that are good for experimenting with like categorical constructions, we'll get there later. But I also needed bigger categories like set category, where objects are sets. So then I couldn't use Scala set type because Scala set type is kind of not good enough for this purpose. If you have, like imagine you have a set of all say strings, right? So what's the size of it? How can you, well, okay, strings you can iterate, but Generally speaking, you cannot iterate over like real numbers, right? So these are uh, things that are too big. So I had to introduce a class called Big Set, which has less features uh, than Scala, uh, like Scala regular sets, and basically you can override some method like equals or whatever. And some of them are enumerable, some not. So a set category is a category where objects are sets, and any sets, because see, it's in set theory, sets don't have types. So that's uh, the kind of, uh, special kind of sets. Not our regular, like, programmer's sets, where, like, everything has a type, so. And set function means just uh, functions from one set to another. Again, like, totally ignoring types. They're all any. And so, <coughs> we have to pass a graph of sets with some objects that we have there. And we provide the composition. And again, like, what are these two compositions? Composition F, compose, uh, composition G. Set function, it's something like a, a regular function, uh, like A arrow B in Scala, except that, well, we have to make sure, ah, we're dealing with sets and ignoring the types. 
So this com compose is defined more or less like a regular composition of uh, functions in Scala. And so we have unit to string just said like category of, of all Scala sets. So it's our ZFC, our Zermelo Frankel sets in Scala. And home, we had to redefine it specifically because like we cannot rename, uh, re, uh, enumerate everything. It's just a construction from like, given one set and another, we build an exponent, so like y to the power of x, all possible functions, assuming that we can build it, right? Some sets are too big, so maybe we won't list all these elements. So of course, uh, although it's a set, it's uh, like, it's tricky and again, we don't know the size. So what's a set function? A set function, uh, like, again, we are dealing with a category of sets, right? So it has a domain, it has a codomain. They're not types, they're just specific sets. We have the, the mapping that, like, the underlying, the uh, hidden thing that maps values, uh, elements of one set to elements of another set. And tag is just for, like, for better, disambiguating when you do print LN, right? So like, what, what function is this? So for, uh, for instance, if you compose one function with another, we don't like compose with everything with everything. So the uh, domain should be the same as the domain of another. And the tag would be like this tag composed with the next tag. So if we could do it, so our domain codomain of this next function, and the mapping is just this. Take an x and return like g applied to g of f of x. So that's the regular composition of a regular function, but the thing is we also wrap, uh, provide domain and codomain, and they're not tight, they're just sets. And otherwise, if we couldn't compose it, we return none. So this is like a partial function of composition. <coughs> so what is it, big set? From Scala uh, point of view, it's uh, the same set, and for like JVM Java libraries, uh, by Java libraries convention, we say that size is max value. It's a signal to some software in Java, in Java library that this is an infinite set. So you, won't, you are not supposed to list all the elements. And like given a set, we build a big set, and because uh, the set is given, so we assume, ah, it's an innumerable, innumerable set. So the method contains is the same as the, what we inherit, and iterator is something that we inherit. Or we can build the set, because we talk about like any possible sets. We can just provide a predicate. So here's the predicate, like your number, uh, like, has, uh, so suppose we deal with a real number, so if it's a real number, so the tenth digit is seven. So like any predicate can be provided. By default it's true, meaning like anything is in that set. So it's a set of all sets, of all scalar sets. So this set. So this big set is not enumerable. And contains only means this. We apply this predicate. So basically this is the set that uh, is defined by a predicate. So what's a non-enumerable set? It's the set where you cannot enumerate values. So in Scala, it's kind of, we are in an interesting situation. So you have a set, you have a head of set. What's a head of set? Is it like our with a choice axiom automatically providing like the first element of a set, even of an empty set? Not here. So, we have this uh, like tag method, uh, not enumerable, so anything you do that like causes uh, an attempt to enumerate will throw uh, this, like, is it empty? We don't know. We don't know that. We don't compare them. So iterator, like if it extends a set, so it's supposed to have a method iterator, not enumerable, no, no, don't iterate, to array. So not enumerable, like you cannot enumerate real numbers in Scala, in Java or whatever. There's no way. Of course you can enumerate like all possible combination of bytes, but well, we are more like idealistic in this relation. So we assume that there is a totally uh, like infinite number of real numbers, although it's 
in real life it's not, but. Okay, so these are categories, right? Next, we build what? Functors. <coughs> to define a functor, we need uh, what, like a domain category that has like objects of x, uh, domain category x with objects and arrows, codomain category with objects and arrows, a morphism from uh, objects of the first category to object to, an uh, to another category, and object from the first, uh, a morphism from arrows of the first category to arrows in the second category. And this means it's a regular scalar mapping, nothing special there. Because we have a type, so for this type we define something. And I added a tag just because like, I like uh, doing println. Not everything is like done by test, so, uh, so I tag the functors. And of course we can define a composition with another functor, and we also have to define identity functor and so on. So composition is defined like this. So given two functors, like g from, so given one, our functor from x to y, and g from y to z, so we produce a functor from x to z. We have to check that, oh, same codomain. So it's even thrown, right? So this composition, what, it doesn't, it returns a functor, not an option. So what do we need? We need to compose arrows, uh, compose like mapping on objects, so on, aka on nodes. And mappings on arrows, so we have these two mappings, like nodes from the first, go, uh, from x goes to y, goes to uh, z, so that's what it is, right? This compose means it's a regular color compose, compose. And we produce a new functor from x object x arrows to this category with z object and z arrows that had this arrow morphism, uh, node morphism, Domain is the original domain, codomain is the, the codomain of the second functor, and the tag is like this. Again, like we just showed that this is a composition of this thing, that's it. Any questions? No. Trivial, I hope. So, a constant functor is defined like this. Given a category C and a category D, and any objects, object in category D, object Y, we can define a constant functor by just uh, as a functor that maps any object in the original, in the domain category into that object Y and any arrow to identity on that object. So that's what's happening. Const, so what do we provide? We provide the first category, we provide the second category and an object in this category Y. So it will be a functor from X to Y this new functor, right? So it's defined like this. On arrows, it's a unit all the time. Every arrow from X maps to a unit on object Y. And so, but we have to provide set morphism, so that's how it is, we, we are dealing with sets, right? So on objects, we just map everything to object Y and tag, says that, ah, we use this, the value of this object Y here. So if it's called like X, uh, well, if it's called object A, so it will say like, this is object A as a constant functor. And X will be the domain of this functor and Y will be a codomain of this functor. That's it, pretty trivial, right? Why do we need constant functors? We'll see pretty soon. Again, like next step, mappings between functors. They're called natural transformations. So they're consistent mappings from one functor to another. Given functor F, given functor G, alpha is called a natural transformation from F to G, and they have the same domain and codomain. If this picture is compatible, like we have for that pullback uh, diagram that we had before, C, B, D, right? So we have this FC to FD, FB to FD, and we have a GB to GD and GC to GD. And we have mappings for each component. So these, uh, I wouldn't call them squares, but like if you rotate the diagram, they will be squares, right? So all these squares should be commutative. So that's the definition of natural transformation, that's it. 
So how do we like uh, implement it in Scala? So we need we need to what? We need uh, one functor from x to y, another functor from x to y, and we need a transformation per object. For each object, we need like something from fc to gc. So that's what we have, like set morphism. Because again, we are talking about like set category. So it's a morphism, well, I'm not going there. So like domain will be uh, one functor, codomain is another functor. And so that's how it is like d0 is the domain and dy is codomain. And basically that's it. But when you build it, also this compatibility, this consistency is being checked. Meaning like if you check it on an infinite uh, category, so it may fail if you build like big uh, functors. So one specific case of a f natural transformation from one functor to another is a natural transformation from a constant functor to another. So if you is just an object in our category. So any object in a category can be considered as a functor from like from some other category. And if you have a bunch of consistent arrows, so you can look at it as, well, it's called a cone. Cocone is like in the opposite direction. It's called a cone from U to functor F, but it can also be considered as a natural transformation from a constant functor to a functor f. So we have this class cone from object, this like u is called apex. So what we need to provide for a, uh, for a cone, we need to give the apex and for every x, for every element of this target category, uh, we need to have an arrow from Oh, no, for every object of the original, the domain category, C, D, and F, we need an arrow from U to FC, from U to FD, from U to FB, and so on. So that's why it is like an arrow for every C, every B, every D. So that consists of, uh, that's what a cone is. And again, like we can look at it as a natural transformation from a constant factor. So out of all those cones, like given a functor, so a functor specif specifies objects in, like in the codomain category with all these uh, arrows. So out of all those cones, there is a best one. That best one is called the limit. So what's the feature of the best one, like in this picture? V is a cone. I don't draw this middle arrow because like it should be a composition anyway. So we could start with, uh, like with the basic ba base object. So we have a couple of arrows from V, a couple of arrows from U, but the best one, X, is the one that has a unique arrow from V, a unique arrow from U, and a unique arrow from anything that has this compatible mapping such that these things commute like v to x and goes like this, it's the same as this. v to here, it's the same as this. And the same for u. So this is the definition of a limit. Limit can be defined as a cone. And if we take all these cones, right, we can just find the one that is a limit. Well, maybe it doesn't exist, right? So limits don't always exist in categories. So I have this predicate is limit. So take a candidate and how do we know it's a limit? We scan through all possible cones and see that it factors on the right, meaning like it goes here through this, this one goes here through this. How do we know it does? Well, we have to find all possible arrows. So, an example, Cartesian product is a limit. So what is, uh, what is the functor for which we build a Cartesian product? If we have two objects A and B, we can consider, uh, we can look at it as just a functor from one plus one. Two objects, that's it, no errors. 
So a Cartesian product is a universal cone between all these possible cones, right? So it has two projections and that's it. So a diagram of a category C, like in general, is just a functor from C to D. So if we have a category like, uh, like this, C, B, D, whatever, so, and we have a diagram of sets like set B, set D, set, uh, set B, C, D, and two functions, right? So we can look at it as a functor from this category to the category of sets. So it's called diagram. So if you build a, a Cartesian product or like a, a limit of this diagram, you can as well look at it as a limit of a functor. So we can take like a category of diagram given a functor, uh, given uh, a domain, uh, domain category. We can build all this. So this is a diagram, this is a diagram. They are functors, right? And we can build a category of such diagrams providing like all these things. So natural transformations. Object in this category are functors, that is diagrams, and arrows are natural transformations. So that's how we build it. For bigger things, uh, for bigger domains, like not the likes that we had, we can throw in a category of natural numbers. It's just a category, uh, a partial order, com a complete partial, is it complete? Okay, linear partial order of all natural numbers. So we, we can define it like this. Create partial order, natural, uh, and so on. And what's n? n is the object of natural numbers. So it's a big set, it's innumerable, natural numbers are innumerable, so we have all this. And so the category of natural numbers gives us this. And what's so good about the category of natural numbers? It's uh, TLA plus. TLA plus, it's built on set theory, but it's actually built above, and it considered diagrams, transitions from one set, another set, state set. So, Basically, the whole TLA plus is the formalization of diagrams uh, uh, with the domain uh, N. So we can build like a little bit smaller set, a set of a category of finite sets. So not just all uh, scalar sets, but finite sets, which is easy because, well, like, What's a finite set? It's something that has, uh, where size is less than this. So we define this. It's traditionally called in category theory set F. And we can do, uh, define something that you cannot like, really implement in bigger category. So like Cartesian product. So we can build this. Well, this, this code exists. So we take this set and this set. And if the product can be built, because it's, uh, it may not exist, we don't know, right? It's a category. Then we can check this. This is a unit test for that. So that's what we had. Categories, functor, and short transformation, limits. Limits, like all limits are being calculated. And co-limits too, which is kind of harder. Uh, and deal, dealing with big sets and TLA plus is an example. So if you're interested in like participating in this, well, because like I have some plans, like calculating topos logic uh, based on this and so on. So that would be cool. And references are here. So this is a GitHub repo categories. And Bartosz book is like, is good for programmers. And this book, like once you get through this one, you can read this one and read it again. And so I, I read it like three. <laughs> I did it three times. <laughs> no, probably four. <laughs> So, any questions? <laughs> uh, just so that is exactly right on time. That was very impressive to the second. Yeah? Uh, questions? Who's the nearest to me? Gabriel, let's start with you. Also, with mainly because I'm here. Um, my question is do you have this just a catalog of? Categories in Scala, or are you planning to use uh, quite basically something kind of useful with this?
well, see, like when people ask me, like, what's the use of monads, right? <laughs> so I actually they usually stopped answering it. So this thing, like, why I did this? So that could be like a more precise answer, right? Why I did this? I actually wanted to do, uh, implement diagrams in sets. So a diagram in sets is actually a category of pre-shifts, like, strictly speaking. So if you have pre-shifts, you can start uh, throwing in shifts and uh, Grothendieck topologies in shifts and consider all kinds of topos logic and see how it is. And some like diagrams are good for like introduce uh, for logic. So for instance, if there are loops, so it's a problem. Well, everybody knows that now. Like, uh, so if there are no loops, like if it's a tree, so it's less of a problem because you can always locate like uh, where the trouble happened. But again, it's intuitionistic logic. So basically, that's the purpose. Perfect, thank you. Next question. So is this on GitHub or something, somewhere? Yeah, it's all on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. It's like the one-sided Actually, it makes sense to add the self-reference, like, on the list of references. So, yeah, I'll update it. Any two more questions? Anyone else? Great. Thank you so much, Matt. That yeah. was wonderful. Thank you. So